With millwork well underway for our Cambridge project, we're here in the shop fabricating some bookcases. These here are the horizontal shelves for these cases, and they look kind of weird, but we'll unpack that here in a minute. One is going to be about 40 or so inches, 42 inches, and the other is going to be just under 10 feet, and they both have the same kind of look and the same style. Because these bookcases are going to support a lot of weight, we really wanted to make sure that they were going to be able to support that over the 10 foot span. So we came up with a pretty wild joinery method that is going to be very structurally supportive and it's going to hide a lot of the seams and cuts that we're going to make, as well as give us a little bit of wiggle room to assemble these actual parts. The surround of these cases, so the sides, the top, the back, etc., they've already been installed. We went ahead and installed these early on because we're going to have a 90 degree transition from plaster to our cases and they're all gonna be painted the wall color and we didn't wanna have any seams there. So we went ahead and installed a mud flange directly to the edge of our case so that we can plaster right up to that and then paint the entire thing the same color with the same paint all on site. This is a detail that we've used several times recently and it's working out really well and it provides a really nice clean streamlined look. Before we jump too much into these parts, let's go into the office and take a look at how these are all coming together and what they're going to be in the end. So here in the smaller one, you can see what I had meant by the case is going to be plastered in. If you take a look at these returns, it looks like it's just a wall that these shelves float between. We actually made it so that each edge in the top are actually cabinet sides that are going to be painted with the walls. And we've added a mud flange to the side of the case and we're plastering up to this point and then returning back our case so that it gives us this seamless look but we also have the structure and stability of a plywood case going around that. Because these are bookshelves and they're going to be holding quite a few books, we do wanna make sure that they are structurally sound and that they're being supported on all sides, especially these ends. So we'll have a cleat behind each side as well as running through the back. And these vertical posts will also support a lot of that load. You can see, especially in this rendering here, that the horizontal shelves are sitting proud of the vertical pieces by about one inch. This means we can't just have these shelves floating in there and make them adjustable. We need to actually have a full run of that entire length. So this is where the joinery starts to get a bit funky. So to do this, I modeled it all in SketchUp to kind of give us a better understanding of how these pieces are going to look when they're completed. So if we take a look here, we can see this is the smaller bookcase and I only took the time to model up one of the shelves. I didn't need to do this to all of them as the joinery is going to be the same. So if I go ahead and take this shelf right out of the way here, you can see that I have the cleats on the sides as well as going through the back. Now with this vertical support, because it is two and a quarter inches, that's just three layers of plywood. And the center layer is going to remain full length the entire run and we're gonna notch in for these shelves. So we're gonna do uh, a lap joint on these verticals where they meet the horizontal shelves. So we're gonna do a lap joint where these verticals and horizontals meet. So if we spin around and zoom in, you can kind of get a better idea of what the joinery on the verticals are going to look like. And then if we come over and take a look at the shelves and spin around them, we can see that our center layer of that plywood is going to be set back a little ways. This will allow us to rest our shelves on those cleats. I'm gonna want to do this prior to assembly. Yes, we could do it after with a series of, you know, dado cuts and or rabbiting bits, but that's a lot of work and it's gonna create a lot of unnecessary dust. So I'm gonna go ahead and size these pieces to a little bit smaller so that we can fit them right around those cleats without interfering at all. I'm also going to add a little bit of extra depth here. This will allow me to square that shelf up a little bit later without actually compromising the depth of that pocket for the cleat. So I ran the same cleat across the back as well as the other side. And here in the middle, this is the part that's going to slip right over that vertical support. And what we're gonna do here is actually have the outer layers of that vertical resting on each side. So the weight will actually carry through each vertical down and through the shelf into the next vertical and so on. 
I will be making these cuts prior to glue up as well. For the same reasons, it's going to be pretty tricky to cut these in once the pieces are assembled. It's going to create a lot of extra work and a lot of unnecessary dust again. So cutting them as close as I can prior to, prior to assembly is really going to help save some time. Both are fairly time consuming methods, but again, we really wanna make sure this is structurally sound with the amount of weight that is going to be on these bookshelves. I have a little bit of play here and I don't wanna make these joints too tight that aligning all these shelves or getting them into place is very difficult. I'm going to make this channel a little bit wider than I need. And then at the end here, I'll probably have to go back and trim a little bit so that my pieces fit snug. The nice thing about all these overlapping joints is I don't have to worry about all of my cuts being super clean and precise. I do have a little bit of wiggle room because I do have a full three quarter all the way around each of these pieces to cover any of that overlap. As I start to marry these pieces together, you can really get an idea of what this joinery is going to look like when it's complete. and bringing that right back into place where it's going to live. So to glue up the uprights for these bookcases, we're gonna start by taking our rips, which are left wide so that we can go back and trim them to size. Once we're done, there is going to be a little bit of shifting that happens and the pieces aren't always going to be super flush. So we're gonna make sure that we have the room to trim them later without compromising our end size. So to begin this process, I'm going to clean off all of these pieces, make sure that there's no debris in between our layers, making sure that they sit flat and tight. We also don't want any dust in the vacuum bag, so we'll just make sure our entire operation is dust free. We want to take a look and sight down our pieces and see which way those bows are going. Some of these pieces are going to have a bow to them. We wanna make sure these bows are going in opposite directions. Once we're glued up, this will help keep those pieces together and allow them to straighten out. We wanna make sure we're setting ourselves up for success here. So we're going to stack our pieces in the order in which we want to assemble them and keeping them upside down. So we'll flip and glue each side to make sure that we have a good coating of glue in between these layers. You don't wanna overdo it and put too much glue in there. A lot of the squeeze out becomes a mess and a hassle to deal with later, and you'll just be wasting a lot of time. As I'm flipping and alternating my pieces on top of one another, I'm just gonna use a brad nailer to tack my pieces in place. This is going to help keep them from moving during that glue up. And because I am gluing up multiple pieces here, I don't necessarily have the time to adjust the pieces once we turn on that vacuum bag. I wanna be fairly strategic in where I place the nails. I don't want them to be in an area where I'm going to cut out. These are the verticals that will receive those wide notches, and I don't want to keep hitting nails and ruining our blades. With all our pieces glued up, I'm adding a layer of plastic over our pieces. This is just to prevent any of the glue squeeze out from getting stuck to our bag. This is a brand new bag. Our old bag actually failed, the zipper broke on it, so we replaced that one, and we want to make sure we're keeping this one in good shape so it lasts a long time. So just throwing on a little bit of plastic over these pieces will help prevent any of the squeeze out from getting attached to the bag. Now we're set to turn the vacuum bag on and we're gonna wait a couple hours until the glue is set before proceeding. Now that it's been a few hours, we can go ahead, open our bag up, remove the pieces and start to trim and square them up and add those notches. You can see here what I meant by some of our layers shifting during glue up. These ones must not have been nailed very well and under all that pressure of the vacuum, the layers just started to shift. My pieces are still wide enough because I did leave a little extra room there, but I'm gonna use that to my advantage in squaring these up. Because this top layer is so far over from the rest and it's like that the entire way down, that gives me a nice clean edge to run alongside my fence here to straighten up these pieces. And now you can see I have a nice flat square edge to reference when I'm making the backside cut as well as a place to make my cross cuts and square up each edge.
And now we have our piece trimmed to size. Our long edges are parallel. Our returns are square. We can now begin to lay out for those notches. Right now I am setting up and doing a few experiments to see what is going to be the most efficient way to cut these. Cutting them in multiple passes on the saw is time consuming. It's also a bit dirty, but if I were to use just the router, you know, that's also very time consuming as well. So I'm kind of leaning toward a combination of the two. Instead of using a jig with the router, that would be a bit complicated to set up and keep my lines straight going from all three sides. Um, I can do that on the table saw with great accuracy. And then I think I'm gonna come back and clean up these notches with the actual router. This way I won't have to do as many cuts on the table saw and I'll get a nice clean flat bottom hole for these notches. I'm using a very short pattern bit or flush cut bit that will allow me the flexibility in depth because it's such a shallow cut. I need a shorter bit, but I also want the bearing so that I can ride along that edge. And it's a wider bit, which will mean less passes in cutting into that notch. Since I already cut the notches in the shelves before gluing them up, I'm just gonna go ahead and clean up some of that glue that may have squeezed out in the center of that notch. This time I'm using a longer pattern bit with the bearing on the bottom. This will allow me to run this bit on the bottom edge and clean up everything in between. The pieces aren't sitting flush in the back. That's because on the front of my shelves, I still have this tab that I will need to cut back a little bit further. The pattern's already starting to emerge where we're keeping our one inch distance off the vertical. The shelf right now is a little proud, but once we're able to seat that back, we'll get that desired reveal that we're looking for. I'm gonna go ahead and clean up the rest of these ones and get set up and just repeat this entire process. Now we have the small bookcase fully assembled. We just did a dry fit to make sure that all of our pieces are going to fit, that our openings are where we need them to be. And it also helped determine what the best method was for cutting these so that when I do move on to the larger bookcase, it can be a little bit more streamlined as I do have four uprights in that bookcase. So the next steps for this bookcase is to actually disassemble it and prep it for finish. One of the things that I noticed when fabricating it this way, I was actually supposed to leave some solid blocking here in the front so that this whole front edge has support for our edge banding. I failed to do that during the glue up. So I'll just have to go ahead and add a small block in the front here. Then we can edge band all of our parts, trim them to their final width and send them off to the finisher. That's gonna do it for this. Wait, it's not gonna do it for this week's episode. We have something special for you guys. Previously, we've talked about recording the live Q and A's that we do on Instagram the Friday after these episodes air. And this week we have one of those for you. So keep those comments flowing, drop them here in YouTube and hit us up on Instagram. And here's the Q and A. Welcome to the Q and A for this week's episode of Revealed. We are, we are recording these. We're gonna start recording them, throwing them into the um, end of the Revealed episodes. So if you guys do wanna ask us questions here, we are still answering them live and we will be answering them um, questions from the YouTube comments as well. So be sure to leave them there. All right, let's, let's roll. jump right in. So from a YouTube video, you got asked this question, probably referencing when you walk through the shop tools, mm -hmm. track saw instead of a table saw. Yeah, so that, I believe the question was, you know, how do you feel about um, using a track saw in the shop instead of a table saw? And are we missing out on any uh, valuable uh, I forget exactly how, how the comment was worded. Features, I guess. Yeah, or uh, precision or something. But in general, uh, I'm not a big fan of track saws, actually. I think they certainly do have their place. There are, um, we have a couple of them. We do use them here, don't get me wrong. But for cabinet making, I definitely don't think that they are the end-all be-all. If you're processing sheet goods and you need to make a couple of quick cuts, they're great, they're fine but when it comes down to the finer cuts, like say you have to you know, shave a 30 second off of something 
or you need to do zero to you know just a hair another 30 second let's say they're not good for that there's a lot of deflection in those those blades and what have you so i'm just i'm not a big fan of the track saws in general for this purpose so that's probably just a significant cost thing right yeah i mean the track saws aren't cheap themselves you okay. know they are several hundred dollars to get in on an entry level one um and you know depending on the saw and this person i believe had brought up you know you lose things like the crosscut sleds and the ability to do that sure but you're gaining the ease of being able to make that crosscut with just pivoting a track so, so there, there is a bit of a trade-off but i think the precision with a track saw is far less than with and you're probably going to spend more time with the track saw yeah repeatable generally speaking right you're not making the same repeatable cuts that you can with the, the table saw as quickly and easily all right changing non-standard apps uh, appliances yeah appliances so, sorry yeah the question was um the question was we had recently done a dishwasher panel that was a non-standard size how do we plan to kind of future proof for that in case the dishwasher needs to be replaced so by non-standard size tip what i mean is typically your dishwasher is 24 inches wide that's a standard dishwasher size right. this particular unit was a very small unit and we went with an 18 inch dishwasher they're not uncommon. If there was ever an issue in the future, you can um, find a replacement for it. Your options just become much, much less. So that's all we meant by that. It's still the same rough opening and you can swap that dishwasher out if there is ever uh, an issue down the road. So that was referencing probably our last video. It was a comment on the last video, but I okay. think it was in reference to a video prior or even uh, one of the site visit walkthroughs into one of the finished kitchens. All right, so that was that recent episode was uh, veneer. Uh, Ken talks about most things you'd probably want to know about veneering uh, your uh, substrates. Uh, how wood pricing? What are we? What's going on? Yeah, somebody had asked about um, what we're finding for pricing to be to be up, to be down. What's what's gone up? What hasn't? And this is a question we get a lot. I think we fielded it last time we went live. It's been a yep. few weeks since we've, we've gone live with these. So thank you all for uh, joining us today. But in general, I haven't noticed a big increase in any of the materials we're using in our shop here. So rough, uh, rough cut maple, walnut, you know, the, the like, a lot of white oak. Same thing with our sheet goods. I feel like the prices have maybe gone up a little bit, like a dollar or two, but when we're talking about $100 or something sheet, it's really not significant. Mm. Where we're seeing the increase in these prices is, is in things like two by fours and plywood at Home Depot and you know the other box stores. Um, you know, it's just a supply and demand, right? A lot of businesses have closed because of COVID, the manufacturers, so they're producing a lot less and everybody's home and you know the, the construction field in general, the construction industry in general has seen this huge boom, right, in building. So more of a demand, less of a product, prices skyrocket. And I think this is just my theory, my take on this, is that what we're doing in the products, the materials that we're using here in the shop are different. They're not as common as some of these others. So there's not as much of a demand limiting the price uh, increase. Someone mentioned it's more consumer based. Right. As absolutely. opposed to professional. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. So we're, you're buying more professional sheet goods that not necessarily Joe Schmo Weekend Warrior is going to be right. buying. <clears throat> yep, and it's, you know, a lot of the places that we are buying from, they don't sell to the public, and half the public probably doesn't even know that these places exist, you know, as with any industry, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, it's more of a B2B rather than a B2C. How to have a convo about grain matching. Okay, yeah, this was actually a really good question. Somebody had written in and asked about, you know, they love that we're doing grain matched rails and styles, but how do they have a conversation with their cabinet maker that they want to do that level of, of a build? And, you know, I think it's really, it's just that. I think it's an easy conversation. You just got to kind of sit down with your, you know, the shop that you're going to for your cabinet making and just kind of present to them the, the option or, or, or what you're looking for. Hey, I want grain matched rail styles, grain matched panels. This is a photo of what I'm looking for if they don't know what you're talking about and you know just kind of making sure you're communicating clearly what you're looking for but you have to also expect on the other side of this that it's going to take more time 
and it's going to cost more money, right? So there's a lot more effort that goes into um, making all these green match pieces than to just grab any old piece and, and cut it up. So I think the conversation just starts, starts there, telling them what you want, what your expectations are, but you need to change your expectations as well. Mm -hmm. And this is more of like a general contractor approaching a cabinet shop right. um, or a homeowner maybe. But then the other side of it too, um, totally lost my train of thought there. Your cabinet maker, your cabinet shop isn't really willing to go that extra mile or if they're unable to, then maybe it's time to find another cabinet shop that is. Mm. You know, there's, there's a lot of, we all know these shops are people that are stuck in their ways. They don't want to change, right? Mm. They're, so they uh, found a process that works. Yep, and they don't want to change that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Great, right. good for you. That's what works for you. Have at it. Yeah. But then there are other, other shops who are super eager to take on like new challenges yeah. or maybe even some younger teams out there that are eager to take on these challenges because they want the opportunity to do this. Like what we are doing here with the green matching is very expensive. It's very time consuming. Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone and not everybody gets the opportunity to do that. So I'm sure there are a ton of people out there who are willing and eager to jump at that opportunity and you might even get a better deal, right? Because they're still new to it, trying to get their feet wet, but you have to understand if you're doing something like that, you might not be getting the best product out there, but right. you're helping a guy or a girl learn the process and kind of kind of a compromise, you know, a little bit of a give and a take with that. Okay. How do I know that the torque I'm using for cabinet screws is the right torque? I've never actually tested the torque settings. Uh, if you're not stripping your screws out, that's a good sign. Uh, if you are, take it back a little bit. This is a problem that I have with impacts, right? Matt, you're gonna probably chime in here. Um, maybe we'll get John over here, but uh, the impact debate, right? So my issue with having an impact in the shop, again, like the track sauce, <clears throat> the impacts have their uses for certain. But here in a shop, we're not driving four inch long screws through a couple of two by fours, you know? so. I like to be able to use a drill where you can feel that um, torque, that tension when you're driving those screws and you can feel that the screws tightened up and you're not just blasting, hammering away with that impact and stripping out your screws. It's just one of the reasons why I don't like impacts in the shop. Uh, does it have anything to do with the uh, noise? Well, yeah, I mean, the noise is obnoxious as hell too, but hey. Mike Hume, uh, project manager and his builders there. I uh, did site visit with him last week yeah. and somebody was using an impact on site and he's like, I'm considering banning impact drills from yep. all, all uh, I think about it. every time I hear about it, I want to post a sign up in the shop, like uh, no impacts. Couple questions, sorry. <clears throat> no, no, that's, that's it, go ahead. Matt kind of chimed in. Matty. Classic. Uh, when grain matching veneers, do you look at specific peaks and flames and try to avoid flaws or just general matching color and patterns. It's all about the grains. You gotta look for the grain, you gotta look for the cathedrals, matching those flitches, um, avoiding any of those defects, and you know, depending on what it is that you're doing, you might be able to cut around some of those defects. So just because a sheet has a defect in it, doesn't necessarily mean that you are, uh, yeah, Ian right here, impact drills for life, right? Oh boy, I'm gonna, I'm, where's yours? It's behind me somewhere, I'm gonna hide that on you. Um, <clears throat> Watch out for the impact boy. <laughs> but yeah, it's all about, like you said, everything. The, the grain, the cathedrals, the defects, and um, just making sure you, it's taking the time to lay it all out in advance. Uh, are you planning on filming more cabinet making content with MT Copeland? I'd love to see more advanced techniques. So yes, there's one in the tank for him. One in the tank, and then there's, uh, I, think, I think that one's slated to be out early summer going by the schedule it should be early summer Summer blockbuster baby yeah there you go i know uh <clears throat> aaron butt got invited back too he's doing another one in finnish carpentry i don't know the details about what he's doing but super exciting for for him as well the um the other thing is yeah we're going to be doing a lot more of this we got a lot more in the works for uh some finer how-to stuff and more kind of quick hit how-to stuff as well um I think we he might have missed a word here, but what are you recommending for um, basic plywood or what are you recommending for boxes? For boxes? Uh, I'm guessing <coughs> that's what he's. 
getting the, so for cabinet boxes a pre-finished uh plywood all day three quarter inch pre-finished um dropping down to something like a half inch you don't really save any money uh, yes there's a little bit of cost savings there but not a ton and in my opinion your structural integrity goes down quite a bit half inch is pretty flimsy so three quarter plywood pre-finished saves you money on having to finish the boxes later on those time. right the boxes can be a huge pain in the ass to um, finish so you're not having to do that the finishes are pretty durable and widely available All right, a couple more good questions here what do you use to cut the veneer we find when we cut using stanley knives it moves with cutting the grain i um I use a router. I think we actually did a video on this a while back, or it was part, in part with the router. Uh, so, or in part of a video. Okay. I will um, sandwich my two pieces, or my pieces of veneer between two pieces of say MDF or plywood, something where at least one of them has a very straight edge that I can run the, a router bearing on for a pattern bit. And then my bottom piece is actually a sacrificial board, so that one will stick a little bit lower and I will cut into that board a little bit. Okay. I think this is something that we can certainly do another more in-depth video on. Yeah, that sounds like a good video. I know we have some um, empty Copeland stuff too that's gonna be in the works for veneering, maybe. Do you have plans to experiment with different veneers? I think he's referencing the gray veneer from the Cambridge kitchen. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to wood veneers, we've... Or not wood, <coughs> new materials, not wood. New materials, not wood. Okay, so with wood, we've, we've done a lot. I've, I've used a lot. Not just here, but in the shop I was at previously, we did a ton of wood veneer, so we did a lot of stuff there. Um, Non-wood veneers, I gotta say, I'm not really interested in non-wood veneers, so things like the Fenix laminate that we just laminate, did. Yeah. Laminates in general, not a big fan of. However, that being said, this Fenix product is actually pretty cool. It's got, like, I keep talking about the feel. Like, one day we're gonna have, like, touch, right? Um, <laughs> But the feel of it, it's, it's cool. It's an interesting product. Um, it's new to me, so I'm not, you know, 100% you know, efficient or skilled with it. Yeah. But um, it's certainly an interesting product, and, and I am open to trying new materials like that. But uh, we'll probably give a little bit of pushback. I have one question. It's not from anyone here. It's a personal question. All right. I think we'll end on it. Where do you see the future of cabinetry? the implementation of new technology or yeah. materials or I mean, unfortunately, I'll, let you, I'll let you take the, the wheel on that. Unfortunately, I do think it's, it's going to become more automated, more mass produced. Um, you know, the technology is going to be, be better and I think we'll end up ultimately seeing a demand for it. For higher end mass produced, you know, there are some, let's say European, German manufacturers of kitchens that Everything's mass produced and they go for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the quality is just not there, but it's brand recognition and it's the brand name. But I think ultimately, yeah, things like grain matching and stitching veneers and doing all that will become an automated process. I think mm. the technology will eventually one day be there to do that. But I also think that people value handcrafted you know, yeah. furniture and there's always gonna be a market for that. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's not going to go away. I'm just because I, I in my head, I'm envisioning like a solid piece of whatever, whether it's MDF or a new material, and they can literally carve in the grains of the wood and make the grain look exactly how. Oh yeah. You know <coughs> what I mean, like, I mean, it, so this is kind of like the same thing with with Hive Notebook, right? It's we're going to stop using uh, paper trees, right? Because actually. more and more. Um, products every day are turning to an engineered material rather than a natural material, right? Like in the building industry, how many, like we now have siding and all this stuff that's replacing wood, engineered studs, all this stuff, right? Yeah. So we, we will eventually get to a point, I think, where we're not using, we're not relying on wood products and natural products that much um, for both the actual building industry and for, you know, cabinet making and what those products are. I'm not too sure. I mean, there's a lot of plastics out there that are plastic type materials that are um, being utilized and toyed with. So I'm sure it'll be an expand, expanded on, on that. 
All right. Well, that gives everyone something to think about. Uh, that's going to be it for today. Yeah. If you missed it, you're just joining us and you missed it, it'll, this will be available on Ken's Instagram and it'll also be at the end of next week's episode of Revealed on YouTube. Uh, thanks for stopping in, peeps. Cool. Thanks, guys. See you soon. We're going to record it for Instagram. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that was on camera. Just full disclosure. Right, on that grab one. two more of those shelves. <laughs> <What the> f- <laughs> <bro>. <laughs>